My name is Astrid Bennett. We are taking a trip to Canada today. Aren't we lucky? Um, today we get to take a trip with, uh, with three tremendous artists who will be joining us from different parts of Canada. My name is Astrid Bennett and I'm the president of Surface Design Association, a national membership nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile art. I'm delighted to welcome you to this textile talk celebrating Canada Craft Year 2020. Conversation with Tina Struthers, Mindy Yan Miller, and Nicole Dextras. Craft Year 2020 focuses on craft artists across the nation with its rich tradition of fiber and textile art. Our presentation today offers you a small but intriguing snapshot of three of many Canadian artists working today. We have also profiled other Canadian artists on SDA's social media. Textile Talks webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilts Associates and Surface Design Association. But first, a few housekeeping announcements. This is a webinar. Your screens and mics are not showing. We welcome questions, which we'll answer at the end of artist presentations. Please submit them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on SACWA's YouTube Textile Talk channel, as well as the SDA website. And now it's my pleasure to start introducing artists. <clears throat> First, though, I want to mention that this webinar would not be possible without the support of our sponsors who are list, uh, listed in the opening screen. They include Artistic Artifacts, Aurafil, CNT Publishing, eQuilter.com, Handy Quilter, Misty Fuse, Moda Fabrics, Nine Patch Fabrics, Shipper Publishing, TheQuiltShow.com, Quilt Mania, and Empty Spool Seminars. Our first presenter today is Tina Struthers, a textile and visual artist who moved to Montreal from Cape Town, South Africa in 2011, and who works primarily with sculpture and installation. Her work engages themes such as multiculturalism and multi-ethnic, specializing in combining fiber and textile elements with a focus on detailed surface structure and hand stitched quality. She is fascinated with the movement created by the wind and the sea. Struthers is also known for her artistic practices as a cultural mediator in Vaudreuil, sorry for my French, Thurian region, which is recognized by the United Cities and local governments as one of 11 cities worldwide for sustainable urban development through culture. She has exhibited regional, regionally, nationally, and internationally, and is currently working on her M Masters of Fine Arts in Fiber and Material Practices at Concordia University in Montreal. So let's go to Montreal. Please welcome Tina. Good day unmute myself. Good afternoon. It's such a privilege to, to be here um, amongst such accomplished artists. I feel a bit like a babe in the woods. Um, I'm going to start straight away by sharing my screen and um, just getting my PowerPoint up and running. There we go. I just need to backtrack here two seconds. There we go. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm zooming in from Tujaga, Montreal. It is historically known as a gathering place for First Nations and is located on unceded indigenous land. The Kanayagi Nation is recognized as the custodians of the land and waters on which I'm, we are virtually gathered. I respect and continue connection with the past, present and future in ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. So I'm going to begin, I'm going to try and not read too much of my notes and more just share my work and process with you. Um, I always wonder where to begin a conversation. 
and where to end the talk. So today I decided to go in a circle as we're in constant transition through time and our insights and bodies evolve through our work. So I'm, the first image you see is actually what's currently in my studio and I will aim to talk about this a little bit. Um, my artistic practice started almost 22 years ago and I specialize in visual communication and painting and drawing. But my love for textiles comes from very early on. I started knitting when I was four and the tactile and textural embeddedment of memories and places is, has really been integrally connected to my expression throughout my life. Um, I worked in costume design and theater for many years, and the last 10 years I've been using or choosing to use textile as principal medium in my visual art practice. Um, a huge part of my art practice is social engaged or cultural mediation community arts project. The image you see at the moment really reflects on the time we're living in at the moment where we're two meters apart. And it's an installation that was created in collaboration with a friend of mine that's a mosaic artist, Monica Brinkman. And we engaged um, almost 20 different groups in our community where each person created a separate piece. For us, it was really important with this installation to combine um, both our different craft practices in the sense of mosaic and textile that are both mediums that's really related to our everyday life and everyday existence. Um, it's really an integral part of my art practice. This is another piece which is called the Fruit of Bleu, which is created in reclaimed denim with a local high school. Um, where I had almost 400 students participating and the idea was to share with them, it's about fresh water conservation and I draw a parallel year between the water use in various parts of the world. For me, this social engagement and um, advocacy of causes that are close to my heart with the youth is really important. I'm going to just skip through the images. It's quite a large installation. The students, many of them had never worked with fiber or textile before, and it was sort of an initiation in the realm of contemporary textile art. This is another uh, public artwork I did, which is actually based on traditional textiles from all around the world. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail because I wanna get to my own art practice. And then we have this artwork, which is called Je m'attache la culture, or I attach myself to culture, which really um, was, I created it in 2014. And this really opened my mind to the possibility of textile as a sculptural medium. I work on three bodies of work simultaneously or have been for the past uh, almost six years. I think I have a short a concentration span <laughs> and I need to change. Um, the themes of what I'm working on. So this is a series called Le Food Orbe, and it's all about water use and fresh waterways and the way we are all connected globally through waterways. And it's to create um, awareness for the contamination of water through specifically um, the fast fashion and textile industry. So these works are all created in reclaimed denim, um, where I do a lot of hand stitching and shredding and textural work to try and create movement and flow in my work. So this is another work of the same series and yet another. I work with the idea of shapes of landscapes from maps when I create these pieces to draw color um, connection to the land where water is situated. Um, a second series of work is Voyager, which I'm going to go through really fast because I want to get to the last bit. So this series is really about metamorphosis in the winter landscape as we see it in Canada and the wearing of fur where we cover our skin with the skin of an animal or someone else. And it also relates to the passage of time and physical scarring and metamorphosis on our bodies as we transition through um, 
through our life story. Here is another work. So this series also speaks about trafficking and animal hides, ivory from Africa, human trafficking. I'm not going to get into all the details because I'm trying to really respect my time limit. So this, the last body of work I'll be discussing today is Codex, which I've exhibited various times. I've been working on this body of work on and off for the last um, six years, and it still continues to grow. I was privileged to have an exhibition earlier this year in um, Halifax, but as confinement hit, there's actually a, a guided video tour of this exhibition online. Um, so in this series, I look at the potential metamorphosis or mutations of microorganisms and sea life due to climate change and human impact on the environment. So the idea is to really create a bit of fear in our observation to shock us into changing our day-to-day -day habits to protect our natural environment. Um, this is part of the same series, but it really relates to skin and emotional trauma, where I use shredding and scarring to create a metaphor for the invisible scarring that we have through traumatic events. Um, here you can see some more, and then it gets restitched as an attempt to heal. So this work, 7x7, seven seven, was created in 2017 after all the terrorists attacks in Europe that year. And I use the, the circles to relate to the cycles of the moon and the passage of time related in this context. Um, and it was really to think about the survivors and the family members of the victims and how long it would take them to attempt to heal from the trauma of this event. Um, and then this is Veribus. Um, I have a few more works in this series, which is all created with reclaimed materials, reclaimed VHS tape, buttons, etc. I This work was exhibited in Poland um, in the, the contemporary Triennale uh, in 2019. It really relates for me to the flow of natural disasters and how they transverse borders and how we cannot consider climate change and climate issues as a regional problem. It's really a global awareness um, because nature does not stick to restricted borders. And then what I'm currently working on this year is cellular mutations. and. Yes, to some extent, it relates to the disease, but it's more personal. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer last year in November. So I've been in treatment for almost a year. And one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. And I'm really um, not to be activist on the issue, but I am attempting through my new work to go through this process of being, um, this work's called Harnessing the Power of Fear. So in this process of working through healing, but also creating awareness for early screening and awareness around this subject matter. Um, so this was a work created early in confinement, but really relates to that restrictive feeling and imprisonment, I think we've all experienced at some point during this year. And then this leads me to me in my studio. And what I'm currently working on for my MFA at Concordia University, which is around the theme of breath and breathlessness. And cellular mutations in lungs and organisms. So you can see I'm really looked closely at mutating cancer cells, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm working on abstract lung mutation sculptures. Um, and I'm curious to potentially include performance in this piece um, to uh, include breathing and really relate to the physical restrictions of breath and breathlessness. 
I would really like to thank the surface designers. Ah, that's my alarm. Um, I'd really like to thank the Surface Design Association for the opportunity to share my work. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you very much for everyone for listening and um, for the opportunity. Here we go. Thank you, Tina. That was really powerful. And I loved having a much more in-depth view of your work. Tina is very active um, Instagrammers. For those of you on Instagram, do check that out. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Mindy Yan Miller from Saskatoon in Saskatchewan and also Montreal. With Mindy Yan Miller's work, we see a conceptual focus on materiality, uh, sculpture and performative pieces that investigate labor, identity, loss and commodification. Since the mid 1980s, her work has been exhibited in Canada, Europe and Mexico. Jan Miller lives with her family in Saskatoon, which is to the center of Canada and as I've heard has a lot of snow right now and regularly teaches fibers and material practices at Concordia University in Montreal. Mindy Ann Miller often works with large masses of found or ready-made materials, including used clothing, human hair, Coke cans, and mostly cowhide. From Sask Saskatoon, please welcome Mindy. Hello, thank you very much for coming and thank you, Tina, for that amazing talk. It was a visual feast, but also all the ideas and concerns that you brought up. Um, and I'm just going to um, work to share my screen right now. And I'm hoping um, that it will. Um, so I'm not going to uh, speak to my slides in particular if this works. Um, they're just going to scroll by because I have such a habit of talking um, to my slot, to my images in a certain way and was concerned I couldn't do it within the 10 minutes. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is try not to be distracted by my slides, but just to speak. And um, I wanna thank everybody so much for coming. And I'm going to show you a small selection of the work I've done over the last 30 years. So of course it's hard to choose and condense. And uh, the work I'm going to show you is uh, focusing on some work made with uh, used clothing and also work made with human hair. And uh, more recently I've been working with cowhide and the work takes the form of sculptures, installations and um, some performances. Some of the performances are collaborative. Thinking about my work, I think that the main thing has been um, my interest in materiality and that I come to this from two different directions. One I think is um, maybe more philosophical, um, like an idea of bringing something um, into being. And um, it also, I would say, has a more spiritual sense um, and um, thinking very much about repetition, time, um, and that the vulnerability of things and basically uh, mortality and that things don't last. And, um, and that makes, I think, a lot of sense within textiles as they um, are one of the things that you know, it's not obdurate like stone. And then the other thing that I'm thinking about, I think has very much to do with my education. I went to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design for both of my degrees. And in textiles, um, I studied with Nalco Fleury and we were very much um, taught to think about working with materials in terms of their physical properties and characteristics and drawing out those physical properties. And uh, never like putting our kind of ego on the work, but starting with the properties and characteristics. And then in the rest of studio arts, we were very much um, 
train to work with the ready-made and uh, the idea that the ready-made found objects are already imbued with meaning and um, that we're kind of selecting them. But also I think draw, for me, it's very much working with drawing out that where, how they're made, where they're made, who makes them, um, how they're used um, and how they come to mean in a kind of socioeconomic and cultural, political kind of context. So those are the two kinds of places I think that I'm coming from. But NASCAD was also a highly conceptual school and it was also um, had, I would say, an avant-gardist bent. Whereas my attitude was I wanted to make work that um, I thought everybody, including my family, could understand. And so, um, so what I um, did, what I focused on when I finished my undergraduate was I thought I would start a, like a business where I was making like a craft studio, making things for the everyday. And I opened a studio with my husband. We were making hand painted silk scarves, which some of you will remember was in vogue in the early eighties. And I had five employees and we did pretty well, but it was, very difficult for me because I was hoping to bring together two different forces and uh, they, I guess I'm calling them forces because they didn't go together, <laughs> they just clashed. And one was I wanted making by hand to have a spiritual um, kind of meaning apart from the fact that you're being paid to make this thing that it in itself was something that would enrich one's lives and life. And I hope that that would also happen for the people who, who um, use brought this scarf into their everyday life. It was high hopes. And then the other one was I wanted to make things that were affordable for almost everybody with starting at a low price point. So as you can imagine, those two things were difficult to bring together. And the, the price point trying to uh, part ended up taking over from the more spiritual part and which was kind of thrown to the wayside. So that was something I was dissatisfied with and went back to school to try to work with textiles in a different way. And I wanted to focus on bringing out the idea of labor um, and in relation to textile production. And so I started working with masses of used clothing with the idea that there's a sense of the absence of the body, but that in that there's also a sense of the presence so that these clothes don't just pop out of a machine. There are people who are producing them at every step of the way. And I also wanted to show that that labor had become less meaningful or maybe even meaningless, like there was an emptiness, um, a sense of loss. And um, I was thinking very much about overconsumption. And because I'm a Jewish and their work um, at that time, there was an interest in identity like there is now, the work was often received in terms of the Holocaust. I mean, go figure when you're working with masses of clothing. And so that's something that came into my work as well and um, ki kind of came in and moved throughout time. And I've spent way too much time talking about this already. So I'll move on quickly. Um, the dark wall that you're seeing here is um, made of pins, straight pins pushed into the wall according to highlights on an image of water and then hair. So I was um, quite addicted, I think, to the energy of the clothes, the residue and sense of a person. And when I left the weight, physically weight of the clothes behind, I started working with hair. It was important for me in each case that I didn't know who was, who the hair was from, who the clothes were from, and that they had a sense of otherness that I had to bring to myself. Um, moving out to the prairies, I started to become, uh, I was interested in um, working to my location and started to do work more about in relation to agriculture. I started working with cowhides. So as you, you like skin and hair and 
animals like we are animals and animals that are employed by, you know, the kind of capitalist agricultural industry um, to work for us. And um, so I would hear them talked about in terms of being products. And I wanted to show up again, both the beauty and sense of hopefully dignity of the animal, uh, but also that they were employed into the system. Again, working with um, repetition, all my patterns are based on weaving drafts. And um, the work is made very simply like all my work and it's either shaved, the patterns are through shaving or they're through punching holes or they're through cutting with an X-Acto knife. So letting the material do its own kind of thing and not um, getting it to do something that it doesn't kind of do just by being opened with a gap. And lastly, um, Astrid had asked me to include some stitching work and I did a performance with my husband and sister in 2017 in Vienna called Six Million Stitches, Vienna 66,000, where I was stitching one hair, one uh, stitch of hair, um, my hair and people gave me hair onto like a, what's surprisingly called a star badge, a yellow star badge. And my sister was counting the stitches and my husband was talking to passersby also about lives that had been lived by uh, Jewish, um, Jewish Viennese people who had survived the war and were still very proud to be Viennese. And lastly, if you saw a picture of a dancer, that's my uh, sister-in-law, Suzanne Miller. And uh, we did a piece together called Needle and Thread where she created an alphabet based on gestures of, um, so she had a gesture for A, for B, for C, and she was spelling out names that she gathered from the pages of uh, testimony from Yad Vashem in um, Israel. And um, I was uh, made the skirt out of used clothing all stitched together and um, continue to work on that as a performance, as I do continue to work on the star very slowly. And that's my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mindy, an excellent long term <laughs> survey of your work. Thank you so much. I know how hard it is to get it in such a short time. So thank you for that tour. Um, now we'd like to move on to Western Canada, uh, British Columbia, and uh, our final presenter is Nicole Dextrous. Um, her award-winning art practice is rooted in the environmental art movement, where our fragile existence is presented through transformative installations that mark the nature of time. Her practice centers on experimentation and research into uncommon plant-based materials and the revival of little known fibers. Dextrous has exhibited her work in Canada, the US and in Asia. She has staged public interventions with models wearing her ephemeral weed robe garments in Canada, the US and Europe. Um, her work also appeared as a stamp in the 2020 Earth Day collection by the United Nations. She is currently working on her second short eco film Kronos, Time of Sand, which will be featured at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft in 2022. Nicole Dextrous lives in Vancouver, where she has worked as a theater designer, taught workshops, and been very active in the local art community. Her presentation to do today involves several video clips as well, so we will go with that. And then again, as a reminder, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. Thank you, Nicole. We're looking forward to your presentation. Hi. Uh, so getting set up here. You can see my screen and everything. Yes. Um, so uh, just a bit about me. I uh, grew up in a small town in Ontario, which is uh, in Eastern Canada. And this is a photo of my mother's clothing store 
from the 1950s. This is her Christmas uh, window display. So I spent a lot of time in the store as a kid. And I was also the type of kid that put on skits for my friends and was into dress up. Oops. Hmm. That's not moving forward. Okay. Uh, eventually, I moved to British Columbia and I went to art school. And uh, a few years within graduating from the Emily Carr College of Art, I began working in theater and costume and set design. So this is one of the first things that I did. Um, I am, uh, I did the costumes and the set and the masks. And I show you this just to see, uh, to sort of demonstrate how my, you know, theater, theater background, even though I didn't study theater, that was uh, very present in my life. So uh, it influenced where I went with it. And, uh, you know, the first 15 years out of art school, my practice revolved around uh, paper casting, uh, image transfers and photography. And I also show you this because, uh, you know, I didn't realize at the time that uh, I was I was experimenting with a lot of these materials because back then uh, they weren't very well known. And um, I didn't realize that I, that would be something that would continue throughout my practice, this idea of uh, wanting to research materials. So now skip to 2005 and my art practice shifted quite drastically because of a freak snowstorm we had here in Vancouver and we we're housebound for two weeks. And I started to freeze textiles. Now, um, I found that uh, I had wanted to talk about the ephemeral in nature, in ourselves and the environment. And uh, when I just stumbled literally across this idea of using ice, it felt like a perfect material to do that with. Now, the piece I'm showing here, I, I, that wasn't one of the first pieces I did, um, it, but this one was done at the, during an art residency at the Banff Center, uh, it, which is in the Rocky Mountains, which I've gone to several times to do work. But of course, the problem was come summer, uh, I couldn't make ice, so I decided to start a series which I called Weed Robes and that aimed at bringing us closer to an authentic kind of relationship with nature by actually wearing it. And uh, this is the first garment that I made and uh, it's made out of laurel leaves and you can see that I've in the detail there that I've used thorns to pin the actual leaves together. And the concept was to make it entirely out of natural materials. So I wouldn't use a glue gun or duct tape or wire or anything like that. It was quite a challenge that I set for myself. And the tagline for the series at the very beginning was wear it and compost it. So everything I made had to be compostable. So this began a seasonal research project where uh, over the years, it evolved into a whole body of work. And this was the first one that I was able to make that was wearable, because that first one wasn't. So um, I figured out that I needed to make an armature for the pieces, and I made them out of willow branches. And I also took um, classes in basketry to help me understand how those materials work. And uh, also, um, I started kind of coercing some of my actor friends into uh, modeling for me. And uh, what I wanted to do though, that first one was in my backyard. So we never left the yard, but I wanted to actually take the garments to the street because I wanted it to be an urban context for these things. And, uh, you know, in that whole process, I really developed how to deal with the challenges of actually uh, making something that's very fragile and fresh, uh, traveling with it to a location, setting up the model and all this. So this one is actually done with uh, fresh lilacs and you may know that lilacs actually, uh, you know, they, they wilt very quickly. So that was a tough one to do, but it was worth it. Um, and then the other, the next evolution of this was I started to create backstories for the characters because for me they were characters they had kind of a little story behind them, even though that wasn't always evident in the photograph. So this one she's called a maple flapper and her uh, her outfit is uh, basically inspired from these little helicopters from the maple tree that we, that's what we call them anyways, they twirl around. These ones were pink and I saw them as 
uh, it, when I first saw them in the trees, they reminded me of that kind of shag thing of a flapper dress. And then the character the, itself was, for me, she was somebody who was coming from the 1920s. Uh, she was coming to Vancouver to establish herself as a, as a designer and set up a shop. Um, but uh, ultimately what I really wanted to do, <laughs> this took years, uh, was to actually take it to the streets and do a street intervention and talk to people on the street. So this is 2011. This is Laurel Suffragette. And um, um, I just want to say that her costume is based on the Keystone jacket, which was a Victorian sort of working woman's outfit and one of the first patterns that were available to just regular people. And she is a uh, Victorian woman uh, who comes to Vancouver to look at uh, how we have changed in our um, you know, use of factories and, and how clothing is made. So I created her costume. You can see the big mutton sleeves are made out of hydrangeas. Um, the collar, the ruffle is made out of corn husks. The buttons are made out of green cherry tomatoes. And um, the reason why she was coming to uh, the future was because she had witnessed the devastating uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire of 1911, which killed 146 garment workers. And these garment workers had been uh, locked in the, on the top floor of that building. And uh, when the fire broke out, they couldn't escape. So they jumped to their deaths. And uh, that was, it was a horrible thing, but she was coming to see how things had changed. And um, so the idea was to walk around in Vancouver, our little fashion district, and uh, the, the performer would kind of improvise with people in the street. And our tactic was to ask people where their clothes came from. So we wanted to just open up conversations about sustainable fashion. And by looking at their tags, we would ask them where the clothes came from. Most people didn't know, of course. So we were able to actually start conversations in a way that was just very sort of organic. Uh, some people just wanted their picture taken, of course. Uh, but we did have a lot of great conversations and some of them were very supportive of uh, slow fashion. Uh, but, you know, in 2011, slow fashion wasn't really a thing yet. So um, we got a lot of responses. And uh, one of them, the responses was, uh, you know, I just want to buy the cheapest uh, T-shirt possible. And the irony of all of this is that the project being done in 2011, in 2013, there was the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh that killed 1,134 garment workers and they died because they were locked into the building also. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was, it was a very sort of a interesting project, but what it did was it, and fast forward here to 2015, I really wanted to concentrate more directly on environmental issues. So I created this character and she's loosely based on the Greek myth of Persephone. And um, Persephone in, in the Greek myth is uh, taken to the underworld and uh, the earth goes fallow and nothing will grow until she returns. So uh, I thought she was a good metaphor for the environment. And also some of you may know that Persephone eats pomegranates when she's in the underworld. So I made the jacket out of pomegranate peels. And you can see there that they're held together with thorns. Now, when I first did this, um, I was actually, uh, just planning to make a photograph. I mean, I made the costume, we did this elaborate makeup, and then I made the set and we took photos. But uh, when I saw her move, I realized that um, I just needed to make this into a film. And uh, it also started a new series, which I call Addressing the Future. And that revolves around three characters set in a dystopian future who are survivors of climate change events, such as fires, droughts and floods. Um, so, you know, I didn't know anything about filmmaking. Uh, I just kind of jumped into this. And of course I realized that I needed to make uh, more scenes to tell the story. We couldn't afford to, you know, fly everybody out to a forest fire. So 
we, uh, I could make smoke in an orchard and I created this mask that she wears um, to protect herself from the toxic fumes. And um, so this was a way of kind of telling the story uh, and uh, it was the first one in the series. Now, what I'm doing today is I'm working on the second film. It's a short film, they're all short, um, as called Kronos Time of Sand. And he survives in a desert with the aid of edible cactuses and plants for fibers. Um, and it's the second film in the trilogy. And the basic uh, premise of the trilogy is to demonstrate our adaptability and resilience in the face of climate change with our deep knowledge of plants for food and also for textiles. So as I've done in the past, um, you know, the story pretty much begins with the costume. And this one, um, I've made Kronos actually a weaver <laughs> in the film. So we'll see him weaving with his uh, yucca fibers and also dyeing with uh, indigo. And we'll see him do that uh, in the film. And uh, the jacket is made to be ventilated to accommodate the heat. So those little 3D squares that you see in the front, uh, they actually uh, allow for air circulation. Now I've done quite a bit of research with the yucca plant and um, the, what I do with the yucca is I take the green leaves and I boil them and then I scrape them. And when you scrape it, it's just, it's full of fiber on the inside. It's like a big ponytail. And then, so I uh, either make it into cordage or I can, you know, just take like yanks of it and just put it into the loom and, and then I dye it. And uh, I chose this plant because it happens to grow in Vancouver. We're lucky to have a desert plant in Vancouver, but most people here see it as a, uh, a weed. And um, because it's a very tenacious plant, you can't get rid of it. But I thought that was kind of a good uh, metaphor for um, actual uh, survival. So anyways, um, if some of you were here in Vancouver in 2018 for the textile symposium, you may have seen Kronos walking around uh, talking about yucca and uh, you know slow fashion and things like that. And uh, I find that uh, these kinds of projects, uh, this kind of street intervention, it, it really helps me uh, develop the character and uh, you know, sort of figure out the story. I also am thinking of the story as I'm weaving. So I'm not necessarily a writer, but I find that that really spurs my uh, imagination. Now, of course, this, this has been uh, put on hold because of the pandemic. Um, so uh, we're hoping to shoot this film in the spring or summer. And, uh, you know, I, the whole aim of the project is to talk about environmental issues, but also what I want to do is um, express some hope uh, for our future survival through our knowledge of plants and textiles, because I think we've been doing that for a long time. And, uh, you know, we're a very resilient, creative and industrial people. And uh, even in the future, we're gonna look great. <laughs> so um, I wanna thank you for uh, coming and sharing my work with me today. And uh, thank uh, SDA for this great opportunity. Thank you. Bye. Wow, Nicole, thank you so much. Fascinating. I think our audience really uh, expressed those sentiments as well. So thank you very much. Okay, our tour of Canada, we see a lot of interest in environmental issues and so forth. And uh, Nicole, I have a quick question for you. Do you have the videos that you showed some of those in larger formats on your website? Uh, yeah, they're actually more on our Indiegogo page because we had to create a whole bunch of little videos. So our Indiegogo page, if anybody goes there, you just um, type in the search Kronos Time of Sand and I'll, I'll have a link to that people can uh, okay. maybe go Wonderful. to. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mindy and Tina, feel free to join us. We'd like to really uh, go for some audience questions right now. And again, I, if we were all here in the audience, we'd do some clapping. So, <laughs> so um, um, we uh, had some, some questions here. I'm curious to know, 
So how the three of you are, what is, what is it like in Canada to be an artist during the pandemic, other than what Nicole said about not being able to shoot? And I know that Mindy is teaching remotely. Is there anything else that you um, have experienced that might be different or the same as what we're experiencing here? Um, I'll go quickly. Well, I actually had a photo exhibition in Halifax, which was supposed to open in March and they got locked down the day of the vernissage of the official opening. So everyone's been adapting to this new online world. And what's been really remarkable is um, other than teaching remotely and attending courses remotely, there's been a lot of gallery tours. For example, that exhibition, they ended up doing a virtual gallery tour with voice. And there's been a lot of other events like that and artist talks. I think everyone's um, adapting to this new world and it actually gives us a lot more access to um, participate in in various events with a larger platform and i personally love the fact that i can see um, exhibitions and work and artist talks from all around the world because of the pandemic which before that would have just been a local event so yeah and yeah. it looks like we only have 12 minutes, so I should probably get to some of the questions too. So mm -hmm. if anyone had anything else. No, that's good. Okay. Um, we did have some questions. Um, uh, Pat Patricia is wondering how you keep your materials fresh while you're working on them, Nicole? Uh, well, uh, I'm in the shade. I have lots of buckets of water. Uh, and I've learned to uh, create the, the piece and organize it in a way that the things that are the most vulnerable, like the things that will actually wilt the fastest, are the last ones that I put on. Mm -hmm. And I have to confess that lots of times I'm there late at night putting on those last lilacs in there. Uh, which makes the whole next morning of organizing ourselves and going to the shoot and all that a little bit crazy. Um, but that's one way that I've worked around it. Uh, recently, I did um, a piece in Paris for an exhibition there. And because it had to last for four months, I actually used uh, dried materials. Uh -huh. And I've been working oh. with bark a lot. So that is already kind of preserved. And I would imagine that it really depends on, I mean, a lilac dress is not gonna last very long and others would, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the, and actually, you know, like the laurel leaves and magnolia leaves, those were the first things that I kind of came up with because they were just around, but they're the best. Yeah. Um, we also had a question on how Mindy sources her animal hides. <laughs> a lot of people here, assume that um, I'm like preparing the hide from a cow. But no, I am vegetarian. And uh, I actually am just buying them from a place that you might have there too. I don't know, Tandy Leather and sourcing them from places that sell leather. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, uh, we had a question. Someone had seen the Persephone uh, presentation and really thought it was incredible. We have a couple of questions that are showing up on chat, so I have to go. Um, Nicole, what was the third film in the trilogy? Have you um, determined that yet or was the Kronos uh, one? Yes, the third? it is going to be about a woman uh, surviving in a flood and uh, she's going to be living in a house where she grows her own rice. Okay. With the water. <laughs> and, her, and her costume will revolve around rice stuff, yeah. noodles maybe. Um, there's a question from one person. Much of your collective work is avant-garde. Is that a tradition in Canada? Hmm. Well, I don't know, but uh, you know, I didn't even go to textile school. I went to Emily Carr and like uh, NASCAD, which has textiles, but you know, it's, it's highly conceptual. So uh, I'd say that was the general trend in Canada. So it kind of pushes us in that direction too. I think that's a, a, a main thing. Mm -hmm. 
Mindy or Tina, do you have anything to say? Is that? I, I just to add to that, I think the conceptualization is really important. And there's a lot of focus on, on that content, um, which leads to work that can be more avant-gardist or, or experimentational. Yeah. So. Yeah, those are good, good comments. Um, we, um, uh, Mindy, uh, you mentioned that the labor source is usually faceless. And then you talk about not wanting to know where the hair or the clothes you use come from. Are those two things related? Um, I think so. I mean, I, you know, I, I have students that might do work like that it's about their grandmother and their grandmother made something or you know where the hair is from. And that's um, a very different feeling. And I do work very much from feeling. Um, and that's like, uh, I guess, honoring that association and that person. But when you don't know where it's from, yeah, I guess you already said it, it's a kind of faceless labor that isn't given recognition, but I'm hoping through the work that we do um, think about that. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And uh, Nicole, could you say a word or two about your backdrop? picture, your virtual background? <laughs> oh, well, this is some of my willow bark. Um, so I grow my own willow and I peel it at a certain time of year. And then I use it to weave with. It's a uh, fantastic material. I, I love it. And uh, I kind of preserve it a little bit so it stays flexible. Because uh, of course, it's used in basketry a lot. Uh, but to make clothing, clothing with it, I want to preserve it. So um, I, I soak it in oil to, to give it some pliability and it's very much like leather. Mm -hmm. And I dye it too, so I've used it in all sorts of things. Wonderful. Um, uh, Tina, um, your examination of cellular images, do you consult with scientists or books? How do you derive the images that you, is this part of the process for you? I, I'm very organic in my creation process. So I really sometimes just, I start with sketches, but very often the ideas um, just come to me and they evolve from there. But I do do some scientific research and I have been this year specifically looking at a lot of images of cells and consulting with um, my doctors on, on that and various other people I'm and medical books for sure I'm really in, curious I'm curious about everything that I touch and attempt to do and it leads you to do a lot of uh, strange research sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah do you I have a couple other questions but I'm curious since the three of you are from different parts far away do you have any questions for one another uh, yes, so Mindy, uh, I was just wondering the uh, the pieces in the field that, of course, look like uh, uh, bales of hay. Did are you originally from Saskatchewan, or did that come about from moving there? It definitely came from moving here. I was living in a small place, um, fifteen thousand people, which is not considered small for here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, you know, fourth tier, <laughs> fourth tier city. So yeah, it really comes from like being surrounded by farms and here, every almost everybody from here is from a farm or their parents grew up on farms or definitely their grandparents. So very different than living out east in Toronto or Montreal. Mm -hmm. Great. We do have a question how we can access the virtual tour of Tina's Codex exhibit. And I haven't had a chance to look up the link, but- um, I'll try and get the link quickly and throw it in the, the chat. Okay, um, that's great. Um, and one last question here. Um, Nicole, have you ever had to remake any of the ga garments or were they just a one time only? Uh, remake. Well, it depends. Uh, like that first one, I remade it several times just because I couldn't get it to work. So uh, 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't actually remake them because they're ephemeral. So what would happen with that first jacket, then I left it in my backyard and I kept uh, photographing it while it was fading and falling apart with the wind and, and the rain and everything. So generally that's what I've done with the pieces. Um, I've made some pieces that are easier to remake where they have a structure and uh, the, the structure then uh, just allows me to put plants or stuff on it and because I have some of those they're wearable pieces and I've reused those quite a few times but um, those plants are always in soil yeah so okay uh, that's interesting <laughs> yeah yeah well we're our time is uh, closing up here but I just want to take a moment to thank you all for putting such a concentrated um, view to your work for this audience. I know this is a very special experience. Um, uh, I do want to say thank you to our sponsors once again, and thank you to Sakwa for hosting us. The recording will be available on YouTube next week. Uh, next Wednesday, Textile Talks will be taking a one week break for the US Thanksgiving holidays, but will return on December 2nd. We'll also take a break later in December 23rd and possibly the 30th so that our, all of our hardworking nonprofit staff members can take a break. If you have the means and like what you've seen in Textile Talks, we invite you to consider a donation to the presenting organizations as they enter the final months of this very unusual year. Uh, links are in the chat. Uh, but most of all, our gratitude goes to you, our audience, and our creative communities of makers and artists and our presenters today. Uh, be well, and thank you for attending today. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.